The European spacecraft Ulysses has found a tranquil zone in space south of the Sun. The spacecraft's instruments report features of the Sun's environment that are hard to spot in stormier places. Gas and dust grains drift in from the dark space, attracted by the Sun's magnetism. Tremors from the Sun's magnetism help to propel the wind from the Sun, and here, Ulysses has discovered a spray of very hot electrified gas flung from the sun's atmosphere. To human eyes, the sun looks serene. But two years ago, pictures by X-rays from a Japanese satellite show storms raging around the sun's equator. Conditions are calmer at the poles just now. The south polar zone is where Ulysses is flying in 1994, where no spacecraft has been before. Getting it there was the big challenge. The sun bathes the Earth's surroundings in a wind of swift electric particles. The solar wind blows far beyond the farthest planets and fills a huge bubble of space, the heliosphere. But impressions of the heliosphere have always been limited to a thin slice where the planets orbit around the Sun's stormy equator. Every spacecraft was chained to the same zone of the heliosphere until the European Space Agency joined with NASA in the Ulysses adventure. Europe built the spacecraft and named it after the crafty hero who sailed to a land beyond the Sun. The work of making and operating nine sets of instruments for an unprecedented voyage of discovery brought together a hundred scientists from Europe and North America. NASA sent Ulysses on its way in October 1990, but no rockets are powerful enough to drive a spacecraft out of the narrow realm of the planets. So Ulysses set off on its odyssey in the wrong direction, away from the Sun. It aimed to steal energy from Jupiter. Sixteen months later, Ulysses used Jupiter's gravity to alter its course. The spacecraft then plunged southwards, out of the zone of the planets and into unknown space. The sun collaborated, its fever abated, and its quieter mood helped to create the tranquil conditions that Ulysses encountered far to the south, where the solar wind blows fresh but steady like the trade winds on the Earth. News of the outer heliosphere beyond its reach comes to Ulysses by nature's own messengers. Cosmic rays. Energetic particles coming from the galaxy bounce and scatter in the heliosphere like balls on a pin table. The spacecraft's orbit takes it over the south magnetic pole of the Sun in September 1994. The heliosphere's resistance to the cosmic rays is thought to be weakest here. Ulysses will next visit the Sun's north polar region. Its elongated orbit will return it to the south in the year 2000. The tranquil zone reached by Ulysses in 1994 will have disappeared, and the sun will be stormy even at its poles. The scientific teams hope that Europe's spacecraft will still be operating in 2000, so that they can see how the heliosphere changes when the sun's fever resumes. Our ancestors worshipped the sun. They knew perfectly well that it rules the earth. And many temples and churches still point towards the rising sun. Today's devotees are solar astronomers and space scientists who stand in awe of the sun's vigor, its violence and its variability. They know how it powers life. 
Green leaves act as photoelectric cells, absorbing the sun's rays. They know how it powers the world's weather, mainly by heating the tropical oceans. But the sun's own weather still baffles the scientists. The dark sunspots are scenes of intense magnetism, while great loops in the sun, shaped by magnetic arches, can trigger a magnetic explosion. A solar flare has the force of a billion H-bombs. And concern about the Earth's changing climate gives an urgency to solar research. Some experts doubt whether the recent warming of the Earth is really due to carbon dioxide. Danish scientists have discovered that a speeding of the sun's activity seems to match the changes better. Records of a changeable sun go back thousands of years. They show repeated variations from one century to the next. Who can understand the Earth's environment without sufficient knowledge of the sun, which warms it and gives us life? Some rays from the sun penetrate even the rocks of the Earth. In an underground laboratory at Gran Sasso in Italy, a tank of liquid detects particles called neutrinos coming from the very core of the sun. But many features of the sun's behavior are invisible from the Earth's surface. Only spacecraft can discover them. The Japanese Yoko satellite monitors X-rays that come from the sun's hot atmosphere. And the European Space Agency is leading a succession of solar missions conducted in partnership with NASA. Instruments in the European recoverable carrier Eureka monitor changes in the sun's output of energy. Nearing completion is SOHO. Its instruments will study the motions of the sun's surface and atmosphere when SOHO stations itself on the sunward side of the Earth. Then, four European satellites called Cluster will fly in company around the Earth. They will explore the turbulent realm above our heads where the electric wind from the sun contends with the Earth's magnetism. Among the European Space Agency's solar missions, Ulysses has the farthest to travel. It spent four years reaching a position far south of the Sun to observe its behavior from new angles. In 1995, it will pass over the North Magnetic Pole. The Sun's magnetism is highly variable and puzzling and keeps changing the Sun's behavior. The wind blowing from the sun drags its magnetism out into space. The rotation of the sun twists the magnetic lines. They're tightly wound around the equator and they corkscrew away into space. The solar wind and its magnetism have a long reach. They command a domain far larger than the orbits of the planets. We live deep inside the empire of the sun. Ulysses explores this windswept empire afresh by flying over the poles. It helps the scientists to make better sense of the stormy star to which we trust our lives and to solve the magnetic riddles of its changeability. As it flies to unknown territory beneath the sun, Ulysses is doing well after four years in space. With its gold-colored thermal blanket, it looks like a gift-wrapped parcel. Ulysses has come a long way from the shore of the Bodensee, where German engineers assembled it for the European Space Agency. Colleagues in nine other European countries supplied vital parts for building and operating it. Ulysses windmills through space. Its spin gives it stability. That thick tube is the radioactive source that powers the spacecraft. NASA provided it, as well as undertaking to launch Ulysses. And wherever it goes, Ulysses, controlled by engineers of the European Space Operations Center, points its radio dish dutifully at the distant Earth. Giant dishes operated by NASA in California, Australia and Spain listen out for signals carrying the news from deep space. 
They're fainter than a car headlamp seen from a billion miles. Similar collaboration created the sensors that Ulysses uses to judge the moods of the solar weather through which it flies. Magnetic sensors cling like sailors to the gyrating boom. One comes from London, another from Pasadena, California. A radio mast, wire antennas and other instruments detect radio noise emitted by the sun and pressure waves in the solar wind. Scientists from Paris and Minneapolis collaborated with NASA's Goddard Center. A key instrument that sorts and counts the atomic particles of the solar wind hails from Los Alamos, New Mexico. Other particle detectors were supplied from Bell Laboratories, New Jersey and from Lindau in Germany. This experiment finds neutral gas flowing into the solar system. A joint venture from Maryland and Bern in Switzerland detects chemical elements coming from the Sun and nearby parts of the galaxy. And Ulysses has its dustbin, conceived in Heidelberg for gauging grains of dust coming from interstellar space. The biggest experiment is Chicago-led. Six telescopes detect cosmic ray particles arriving from the universe. Scientists from seven countries collaborate in this experiment. Finally, X-rays from the erupting sun register in an instrument developed at Toulouse in France and Garching in Germany. It also picks up mysterious bursts of gamma rays from distant space. Some 50 institutes in Europe and North America share in Ulysses' science. So when the sun coughs, the sensors twitter in chorus. The US Space Shuttle Discovery carried Europe's Ulysses into space in October 1990. A two-stage rocket motor then sent it on its way as the fastest spacecraft ever. But like its mythical namesake, Ulysses went to its destination the long way round. Its target was the Sun, so it headed out to Jupiter instead. The spacecraft used the giant planet's gravity to hurl it over the poles of the Sun in a novel orbit. The maneuver needed immaculate navigation and strong nerves whilst belts of radiation around Jupiter threatened the spacecraft's delicate electronics. In the outcome, the encounter in February 1992 gave the scientists a rare chance to observe the planet's wild surroundings. The navigation of the swingby was flawless and Ulysses found itself heading south. Its progress below the Sun's stormy equator was what mattered to the scientists. By June 1993, it was in unknown space, at a higher solar latitude than any previous spacecraft. As the track curved back towards the Sun, the angle from which Ulysses observed it increased more rapidly. By January 1994, 50 degrees. In July, 70 degrees. And on the 13th of September 1994, Ulysses attains its farthest south at 80.2 degrees. Over the sun's Antarctica, the solar wind and magnetism are very different from the conditions in the equatorial zone. That's the whole point of the mission. Thereafter, Ulysses climbs to the sun's equator and passes to the north of the sun in mid-1995. When it returns to the orbit of Jupiter in 1998, the giant planet won't be at home. So unperturbed, Ulysses will repeat its orbit back to the sun's south pole. There's talk of keeping the spacecraft operational for this second visit to the sun around the year 2000. When the moon eclipses the sun, faintly glowing matter can be seen soaring high over the solar surface. If you had X-ray eyes, like the Japanese satellite Yoko, 
you'd know its atmosphere is extremely hot where dark sunspots freckle the bright surface. The sunspots are symptoms of a magnetic fever on the sun. It subsides every 11 years or so, then rises to a maximum in the active phase of the sunspot cycle. Violent storms on the sun are felt throughout the solar system. On the Earth, spectacular auroras light up the northern skies and compass needles wobble. Radio and power blackouts can result. In space, the solar storms put astronauts at risk and cut short the lives of near-Earth satellites. Linking these events is a gusty wind of electric particles that blows unceasingly from the sun. Europe's spacecraft Ulysses reads the messages in the solar wind so that scientists can decode them and make better sense of the sun's magnetic fever. The solar wind drags out the magnetism and the sun's rotation twists the magnetic lines into spirals. From northern and southern parts of the sun, oppositely magnetized winds fight to possess interplanetary space. They finish up blowing one above the other. During its journey towards Jupiter, Ulysses was in the sun's equatorial zone. But its magnetism was tilted, as shown by light patches sprawling across the equator in Yoko's images. As the sun rotated, Ulysses felt first the northern solar wind stream and then the southern. The direction of magnetism kept switching. Scientists call this magnetic convolution the ballerina's skirt. Explosions on the sun noted by the spacecraft's X-ray detector pursued Ulysses with blasts of high-speed particles. They caused shock waves as they overtook the slower moving solar wind. As the explosive activity died down, more persistent streams of fast particles created long playing shocks that returned to the spacecraft every time the sun revolved. Ulysses endured solar weather of this kind after it swung around Jupiter and headed south. Not till it was 29 degrees below the sun's equator did Ulysses leave the ballerina's skirt behind. The storms abated too, and the last shock wave occurred at 55 degrees south. Since 40 degrees south, Ulysses has flown in a pure wind of southern magnetism. It came from the dark region in the X-ray picture called the South Coronal Hole. The sun was also quietening down as a sunspot minimum approached. The prevailing wind was much faster than in the equatorial zone, but much steadier too. Its composition had changed. Ulysses detected fewer heavy elements in the wind compared with the equatorial zone. This corresponds with a cooling of the solar atmosphere from 1.8 million degrees at the equator to 1.2 million over the south coronal hole. The fair weather helped the scientists to spot subtle features of the solar wind. The magnetic waves, for example, that helped to propel the wind. And strange magnetic lulls registered in the magnetometers on Ulysses' boom. For periods of up to a minute, the sun's magnetism vanished. Scientists believed the lulls were due to blobs of matter flung out from the sun. Matter so hot, dense and highly conductive that it expelled the magnetic field. So the sun seems to throw out not just a wind, but a hot spray too. This discovery may help scientists to explain the upheavals near the sun's tumultuous surface, which create the solar wind itself. The magnetic sea around the Sun, explored by Ulysses, extends far beyond the European spacecraft's orbit. Scientists picture this heliosphere ending when the pressure of the wind from the Sun is no longer able to push aside the thin gas that fills the space between the stars. 
But the heliosphere's boundary is a long way out. American spacecraft have journeyed away for nearly 20 years without finding any edge to the Sun's empire. Perhaps the two Voyager spacecraft will, after another 10 years, find the solar wind slowing down at a distance of 10 or 15 billion kilometers. Meanwhile, Ulysses explores the outer heliosphere by analyzing cosmic rays that enter it from the outside. As high-speed atomic particles arrive from exploded stars far away, a battle begins. The far-flung solar wind deflects and scatters the cosmic rays. By the time some of them reach the Earth, they are fewer and weaker. The cosmic rays are easy to detect. They're not quite harmless, but there's no avoiding them if you live on this planet. The cosmic drizzle is weakest when the sun is most active, at the height of its sunspot fever every 11 years or so. When the sun is quiet, the heliosphere shrinks. It's a less effective shield against the cosmic rays. And in times past, the sun was weaker than now, as recalled by ancient trees unearthed in Northern Ireland. Scientists in Belfast have put together dated rings of annual growth going back 7,000 years. The wood contains radioactive carbon made by cosmic rays when the trees were alive. Variations in the radioactivity suggest that the sun is forceful in one century and feebler in the next. Making sense of this record depends on judging the battle with the cosmic rays far out in space. During its long journey, Ulysses has monitored variations from week to week, when disturbances from the rotating sun have swept across the scene. It's seen false cosmic rays, newly created from atoms drifting in from interstellar space. First they're charged, then they're accelerated. Now, Ulysses flies far south of the sun. Here especially, its observations of the cosmic rays will check the theories of how the battle proceeds in the outer heliosphere and of how the advantage may tilt with the passing of time. The sun is only one star among many and as it wanders among its neighbors in the Milky Way galaxy, it feels a breeze from the gas of interstellar space. The huge magnetic bubble surrounding the sun, the heliosphere, is probably streamlined in the direction of the breeze. Far out in space, instruments aboard Europe's spacecraft Ulysses detect the atoms arriving from interstellar space. Being electrically neutral, they suffer no impediment from the sun's magnetism. Ulysses finds among them most of the common chemical elements, hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, oxygen, but very little carbon, the key element of life. It's strangely scarce. Part of the answer comes in dust grains carried in the cosmic breeze. They pound into Ulysses' dustbin, the spacecraft has left the dusty traffic lanes of the planets far behind, so it can easily identify the grains of true interstellar dust. Some of them are much heavier than the scientists expected. They're probably rich in the missing carbon atoms, and they may be coated with ice. This dust and the flavors of the cosmic breeze give Ulysses direct contact with material of the kind from which the Sun and the Earth were formed long ago. But at present, we're traveling in an unusually sparse region of space. Sometimes the Sun encounters much denser clouds of gas. Then the great magnetic bubble around the Sun, the heliosphere, is compressed. Its boundary may come close to the Earth. Then hydrogen from the solar wind, unable to escape, may react with the Earth's oxygen to make ice clouds in the upper air. Without the shield of a large heliosphere, the Earth can suffer strong bombardment by cosmic rays. Such a bombardment may have occurred 35,000 years ago. It's another scenario for the scientists to ponder, while Ulysses sends its new tidings of the Sun's cosmic environment.
the mission of Ulysses is to observe the Sun from new angles. It comes to its first climax as the European spacecraft crosses under the Sun's Antarctic zone. On the 13th of September 1994, cruising through regions never visited before, Ulysses will pass within 9.8 degrees of the Sun's axis of rotation. At some time in September, it should pass directly beneath the magnetic pole of the Sun. Scientists monitoring the signals from Ulysses instruments can't be sure exactly when that will happen. But that's the point of their adventure, to define and make sense of the Sun's erratic magnetism. They're prepared for surprises, but they're expecting calm conditions over the pole. The Sun's in a quiet mood this year. Magnetic tremors that drive the wind from the Sun should be plainer to see than ever before. There may be more of those strange magnetic lulls that tell of hot spray from the Sun's atmosphere. And hopes run high among the Ulysses scientists who study the cosmic rays coming from the universe at large. These energetic electric particles are usually filtered by the great magnetic sea that surrounds the Sun, the heliosphere. But there may be a hole in the heliosphere over the Sun's magnetic pole, in these quiet conditions. Ulysses may find cosmic rays pouring in almost unhindered, in the most pure state ever seen. If so, this will be a bonus to scientists who trace the cosmic rays back to their source in exploding stars far away in cosmic space. And such a discovery would help those who study changes in the Earth's climate. They could be more confident in reading past peaks in cosmic rays, recorded on Earth as symptoms of an inactive and cooler sun. The Ulysses adventure is far from over. In 1995, the spacecraft will dash across the sun's equator and fly over its north polar regions. The sun may be even calmer then. The hundred scientists who run the experiments aboard Ulysses want its operations to continue into another orbit. The spacecraft will in any case fly on, out to the orbit of the planet Jupiter in 1997 and then back towards the sun's south pole. Around 1999, the Sun's magnetism will flip, first in the sunspots and then at the poles. By the time Ulysses returns to the south polar regions in the year 2000, the south magnetic pole will have become a north magnetic pole. And it will be a time of high sunspot fever in the Sun. Stormy conditions over the pole will contrast with the calm of 1994. If Ulysses' operations can continue, then Europe's bold space mission will bring even deeper understanding of how our mother star rules the space around it in all its fickle moods.